Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first uh, session for uh, the 2019-2020 uh, year. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Tomasz Karasek uh, to uh, the, uh, the Center for International Defense Policy. Um, uh, Tomasz is uh, the head of the Department of Security Studies. Uh, he's the Vice Dean for Development uh, in the Faculty of Social Sciences at uh, Charles University in Prague. He holds a, a PhD and a Doctor of Laws, uh, uh, both from uh, Charles. Um, his research focuses on European and transatlantic security and, and in particular on uh, uh, strategic culture. And today, uh, some 30 years after uh, the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, um, he's going to be looking at the Czech Republic and European security um, and uh, uh, basically looking at the perspective of um, the, uh, uh, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. So without further ado, and once this starts, <laughs> and hoping uh, that uh, we don't need a password to get in here. Yeah. <coughs> Let's see. Well, anyway, I'll start. Uh, good afternoon. You can't see it, but the computer just said that it ran into a problem. I, well, we can actually see that, I guess. So, so I'm very happy for uh, and grateful for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm uh, uh, actually started uh, the connection to Queens a year or two ago uh, by getting into con uh, contact with David Haglund uh, over a panel at a conference uh, where we were discussing strategic culture issues and uh, as it happened uh, the institute of which my department is a part uh, at that very time actually started developing a cooperation framework within, uh, within the so-called Erasmus Plus uh, funding scheme by the European Union to actually enable, uh, enable institution to institution academic exchanges. So that's uh, my stay here is, uh, is, a result, uh, is a result of that. Uh, the topic I'd like to talk about is actually a uh, significant part uh, of an article that uh, me and David Heglund are preparing at the, uh, at the moment, which sort of addresses the issue of uh, generally the rise of illiberalism in Central and Eastern Europe and not only there, I, I'm, I'm afraid. And in particular uh, the question uh, whether the enlargement of NATO in 1999, which was uh, of course uh, the, the great event of 20 years ago, uh, was a sort of a strategic or political mistake uh, given uh, the fact that uh, the promise of the spread of liberal democracy to, to this corner of the world, meaning the region of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, seems to be <coughs> running into, uh, into some somewhere even great trouble. I mean, if we think particularly, of course, of, of Hungary. The, dev uh, the, the article that we are, uh, the argument that we are trying to develop in the article uh, is that uh, the Czech Republic uh, is nowhere near uh, the scope of the problem which is faced uh, by Hungary. Uh, where Viktor Orbán seems to have really deeply established uh, a regime that's uh, still notionally democratic, but uh, in many ways, uh, let's say, proto-authoritarian, definitely, uh, definitely illiberal in uh, its sort of formal makeup and, uh, let's say, its, uh, its practical dealings uh, with political opposition, NGO, civil society in general, uh, and academic body, of, of course, not to forget the case of the, of the Central European University. Uh, so in the Czech Republic, uh, there's uh, not been uh, so perceptible shifts towards, uh, let's say, uh, illiberal, uh, Makeover of the political of the political system, but there have been some troubling uh, some troubling signs, which uh, I like to address uh, further on in the in the pr presentation. I think that the computer is slowly getting uh, getting to the point of uh, point of restarting. So I'd like to actually talk about talk about four major themes uh, in my presentation. The first is uh, the importance uh, of uh, what was called uh, a return to Europe. Uh, during the Velvet Revolution of November 1989, uh, which uh, was not just a slogan, it was uh, a sort of deeply felt urge on the part of those uh, citizens uh, dissatisfied 
uh, with the, with the communist regime in the uh, in the country, and which also became something like an over overarching uh, overarching theme of a broad political foreign policy consensus among the Czech uh, among the Czech political political elite. Secondly, I will uh, try to address uh, the issue of a, of a Czech strategic culture. Uh, in sort of broad strokes, so I will try to outline the specific qualities uh, which uh, the Czech strategic thinking, so the thinking about uh, the security and particular defense policy and its applications uh, have uh, has emanated uh, throughout the 30 years and uh, there are some sort of not necessarily particularities but specific features which uh, then make the Czech Republic uh, maybe uh, uniquely susceptible to the challenges and threats of, uh, of today. And I will try to link uh, the, the challenges to the particular features of the strategic culture in the third part of my, of my presentation. I, I will try to wrap it up with uh, a sort of a attempt uh, at, a, at a prognosis for possible future, future developments with, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, the necessary footnote that any predictions about the future are always, uh, always problematic uh, or, rather, or rather futile. So uh, one is always, thank you very much, uh, one is always surprised uh, in, and, and uh, very often uh, in a very unpleasant way. So I believe I can, oops. That's what happens when you transfer the thing to another computer. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I'll start uh, with uh, what really was one of the major or principal slogans of, of the 1989 revolution in, in Czechoslovakia, in then Czechoslovakia, uh, the, return, the return to Europe. I mean, the underlying feeling or the underlying political preference of the people protesting against the communist regime was not just that the regime is bad, ineffective, brutal, suppressive of human rights uh, and of course many, many other uh, negative uh, things attached to that, but also that it was a sort of a regime which, uh, which hijacked the European belonging or anchoring of, of, the, of the Czech society. I mean, this of course uh, this rhymes well with, uh, with the historical facts of uh, how the communist regime was, uh, was imposed by a communist party, very closely linked, of course, to, uh, to the Soviet Union, basically being answerable primarily to, uh, to the people in Moscow, meaning uh, the leadership of the, of the Soviet communists, not necessarily the, the Czech population, despite the fact that unlike uh, in other countries in the region, say Poland or Hungary or Romania, uh, the support for the communists in Czechoslovakia, and particularly in the Czech part, of the state uh, after World War II was relatively high and uh, the, the, the communists actually did win the elections of, uh, of 1946, uh, though uh, they, didn't achieve, uh, they didn't achieve a majority. But despite that, I mean, by 1989, uh, a feeling has uh, really crystallized that uh, what happened to the Czech society and Czech politics was that it was really sort of forcefully divided from, uh, from, the, uh, from the European history to which it, uh, to which it uh, sort of uh, ought to have or to have belonged. Hence uh, the idea of the, of the return, uh, return to Europe. So, so the idea of sort of reintegrating the country back into what might be termed the European mainstream, which of course uh, then, uh, then crystallized in uh, very specific foreign policies uh, of trying to join both NATO and, uh, and the European Union. So if we, uh, if we were looking uh, for a sort of a grand uh, foreign policy consensus of uh, particular 1990s, it was to actually get the Czech Republic into Europe and let's say the broader Euro-Atlantic uh, Euro region. Uh, and uh, one of the problems uh, of, of this was that uh, not too much thought was actually given to, uh, to the question of what the Czech Republic actually wanted to achieve once in these organizations. So after, uh, after 1999, when, when the Czech Republic actually joined NATO and or 2004 when it joined the European Union, what we can <coughs> witness is sort of a, a gradual erosion of, uh, of the consensus in foreign policy, not in the sense that there would be a prevailing feeling of actually wanting to get out of, uh, out of Europe or to sort of uh, want to, to, to diminish the importance of, uh, of uh, the Czech Republic's membership in NATO or the European Union, but rather an erosion of a consensus on what to do next. Uh, some, of, uh, some of the decisions uh, were of course sort of enforced uh, on the Czech Republic's uh, political elite or representation from the, from the outside. I mean once uh, 
once uh, the uh, once uh, the terrorist attacks of 9/11 happened, and uh, the, the rest of uh, of the alliance basically sort of uh, convened around the idea of actually helping out the United States uh, in places like Afghanistan. Uh, it sort of gave the Czech Republic also a sort of a new meaning of its for its uh, security and defense uh, security and defense policy, despite the fact that of course. Uh, in a sort of a particularist outlook, uh, there were no specific interests of the Czech Republic in Afghanistan or elsewhere to, to speak of. So basically what the Czech Republic was doing was uh, sort of prolonging the idea that uh, what we need to do is actually be a reliable, loyal ally uh, within, the, uh, within the organization, primarily the NATO. I mean, uh, whenever you talk to uh, the members of the security community or foreign policy community in the Czech Republic, they will always have a tendency to tell you that, of course, yes, the European Union membership is, uh, is important, strategically important for us, but when it comes to uh, the matters of security and especially hard defense, uh, NATO simply takes, uh, takes, a t uh, takes a primary position. So uh, there has always been this clear hierarchy of NATO first, uh, the EU second in security and defense matters, although there uh, have been, uh, let's say, at least Latin discussions uh, between wh who might we might term the Atlanticists and the Europeanists, uh, with typically the result that the Atlanticists actually got uh, got an upper hand at least uh, when it comes to to practical uh, to practical policies. Um, actually, the Czech uh, representation was sort of dismayed by the uh, introduction of what was then called the European Security and Defence Policy after the French-British uh, bargain uh, at the end of 1998. Uh, it was a sort of a strange feeling that uh, when you think that you have reached your primary, primary foreign and security policy goal, meaning becoming a member of NATO, which would have sort of secured all these issues, suddenly there is a sort of an internal competitor which you don't uh, quite know how to, how to treat because you don't actually want to endanger your position or your, uh, your standing in the other organization, meaning the EU. But at the same time, there was a very clear reluctance on the part of the Czech Republic to actually become deeply involved in the European Union security and defense business, so to, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, if you went uh, sort of party from party within the political mainstream, you could see parties who would sort of lean more strongly on the Atlanticist side, typically the, the, political, uh, the political right, or more to the sort of uh, pro-European or pro-European autonomous side, uh, typically when, when you, when you, uh, when you th uh, regard the, the Social Democratic Party. Uh, not that it would be so deeply Europeanist, I would argue, but, uh, but especially the left wing of the party, as I believe is not unusual in European politics, so it was sort of at least latently anti-American or America skeptical, however you want, to, uh, you want to put it. But nevertheless, uh, these tensions uh, were really kept sort of at bay. They, they were really limited. And when you look at the practical policies, the strategic documents, uh, and the sort of a real action uh, taken within the scope of, uh, of Czech, uh, Czech defense policy, it was always clear that, uh, that the Atlanticist, uh, Atlanticist uh, wing of the debate actually is the one who, uh, who, calls, uh, who calls the shots. Uh, that has also resulted into a sort of an important phenomenon which is still in place today, and that is that uh, particularly the bureaucratic level of the security community was sort of uh, inoculated in a way that, uh, that transatlantic security cooperation is basically the, uh, the undeniable, uh, undeniable standard to which we need to, we need to cling. So whatever the changes at the top echelon of, uh, of the political representation, there has always been a very strong sort of professional bureaucratic administrative uh, sort of preference for keeping uh, the Atlantic uh, or transatlantic uh, communication and cooperation in, in motion from the armed forces through the bureaucracy at the Ministry of Defense to, uh, to the people uh, in, in, in the diplomatic service and the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which still continues to, to actually play, uh, play a role. So even if you you look at uh, the current picture where some of uh, the top politicians are actually uh, displaying positions which are notably uh, sort of not so much pro-American, they can be pro-Russian, pro-Chinese, uh, Europe skeptic. Uh, the bureaucracy uh, actually tries to sort of keep things alive and functional uh, in the relations to, uh, to, the, uh, 
to, to, the, to the allies. Of course, the, the big question is if there really is a shift at the political level, and I will get to the question of whether that is or isn't probable or likely. Uh, but uh, but uh, the bureaucracy uh, sort of uh, has clearly been sort of uh, trying to to move on in this direction, which was actually which was actually set at the at the not necessarily the beginning, but let's say by mid 1990s so with the with the declaration of the Partnership for Peace Program in 1994, the Czech Republic basically made it very clear that it wanted to move closer to NATO up to a point of actually formally applying for the for the membership. We might even go a bit uh, further back in the future. I believe that the Czech Republic sort of declared its uh, preference for belonging to the transatlantic security community already in 1990-1991 when it sent uh, its uh, a military unit uh, to to the uh, to the Desert Storm operation, which was actually quite amazing. I mean, the unit was relatively small. It was the the, the anti-biological chemical uh, warfare unit, um, one of the sort of specialized parts of uh, of the then Czechoslovak uh, Czechoslovak army. Uh, it was amazing because uh, the Czechoslovak People's Army, the, the one of course which existed before 1989, was basically breeded and trained for one purpose only, and that was to participate in a possible uh, possible invasion of Western Europe. So that a part of this uh, this army was really sent within a two-year scope uh, to a completely different uh, type of an operation, completely different inter uh, international setting, was quite uh, quite an achievement. There's uh, an interesting sort of story behind uh, the decision was. Uh, quite clearly taken over the heads of the leadership of the armed forces. It was forged politically. There was a specific uh, role of uh, then Czechoslovak President Václav Havel, who really wanted to basically make a gesture towards uh, the United States, but more broadly, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the Euro-Atlantic community or, uh, or, 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 or region. And uh, it was a very sort of symbolic, uh, symbolic contribution. Uh, when the when the unit returned back, uh, they actually uh, were not treated very nicely by uh, by the armed forces. Uh, their contribution to the Desert Storm campaign was sort of uh, forgotten and only then rediscovered after a couple of years, when the sort of pro-transatlantic leading uh, became a clear sort of path for the Czech uh, for the Czech foreign uh, foreign policy, <coughs> which uh, gets me to the final point here, and that's. Uh, that uh, the return to Europe uh, was really sort of very much value-based. It was the idea that what we want to return to uh, was uh, essentially uh, the opposite of, uh, of what the communist regime pre-1989 represented. So basically, uh, it was uh, a preference for what might be termed the liberal democratic order, despite the fact that of what that specifically con constitutes, of course, the, the opinions might, uh, might, have, uh, might have deferred. But nevertheless, there was a feeling that what we want to be like, to, to look like, to function like, was basically the, uh, the, the states of uh, the states of, uh, of, of Western Europe. And there was also, but I would strongly argue that only at the secondary place uh, in the order of affairs, the, the, the geopolitical component, and that was basically to, uh, to sort of push Czechoslovakia, then the Czech Republic, uh, away from Russia. And, uh, and towards closer cooperation with, uh, with let's say, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the West. Uh, unlike in countries like uh, the Baltic states or Poland, uh, where I would argue that the geopolitical reasoning and, uh, and rationality uh, took precedence. In the Czech, Rep Czech, Czech Republic, uh, it seems to have been, uh, in it seems to have been the, the other way around. So, so there was a very sort of clear normative understanding of, 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 of the underlying realities of the, of, uh, of the world. And the geopolitical issue was also just sort of trailing, trailing behind that, uh, that, basic, uh, that basic political argument. Uh, a couple of years back, I was uh, I was doing uh, an analysis of uh, parliamentary discourse surrounding uh, the dispatch of uh, military missions to operations abroad. I was basically looking for the justifications which were given uh, by the proponents and the opponents actually of uh, of these uh, of these operations. And uh, actually, uh, what came out of uh, what came out of the analysis uh, was a very clear picture in which uh, the principal arguments uh, for sending out uh, the Czech soldiers uh, were value-based, normative, 
and especially looking at uh, at uh, maintaining, uh, let's say, the quality of uh, quality of the partnership with the uh, with the allies. So, so basically, the uh, the sort of traditionally realist uh, understanding of, of what why states uh, why 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 state needs and uses military military power were basically uh, pushed to the to the uh, to the background. <coughs> Which gets me to the second uh, theme, and that's the one of a, of a Czech uh, strategic culture. Recently, with uh, my uh, my PhD uh, student who has just uh, just graduated, so a former PhD student, recent graduate, uh, we have performed an analysis of uh, of uh, major documents. Um, meaning uh, security strategies, military strategies, defense strategies of the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And we have been trying to identify sort of uh, some persistent traits which would uh, allow us to, to, to formulate something like basic principles or features of a, of a Czech strategic culture. So let's say the, 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 the underlying cultural uh, milieu which, uh, on, on which uh, the actual decisions and policies are, uh, are, uh, are, then, are then based. And uh, what clearly comes out of, uh, of the documents and which can be linked, uh, as I will do in a, in a minute, to some, some sort of deeper uh, Czech history, is uh, a, a very internationalist outlook and uh, accompanying sort of downplaying of territorial defense. I mean, if you look at the strategies, it's, uh, uh, they talk about defense, but actually they are not about defense in the strict uh, territorial sense not until, let's say, relatively recently, basically not until 2013-14 with the resurgence of Russian power in Eastern Europe, uh, has the Czech Republic been sort of seriously strategically discussing territorial, uh, territorial defense. And since the very beginning, basically since 1990, uh, the primary focus and basically the primary reason of uh, the existence and potential use of military force was actually to contribute to some larger international, international effort, which is not so surprising given the size of the country, its geopolitical location, uh, its historical experience, uh, etc., etc. But uh, when we compare that uh, with Slovakia, so a country which actually has uh, shared with, uh, the, with Czechia, uh, to use the, the abbreviated name, uh, quite a long uh, history throughout the 20th century, uh, there were sort of subtle but quite clear uh, quite clearly other, uh, other accents. So, so there was a much, uh, much more pronounced uh, focus on territorial defense. Uh, there was a much more pronounced uh, focus on the activities of, of uh, external state actors, uh, which basically never uh, was said out loud, but very often you get the feeling that uh, the Slovak strategic planning was still considering a possibility of hostility with, with Hungary, because it's sort of a historical um, uh, the other, to, to put it, uh, to put it this way. So, uh, when after this comparison, it's quite to, uh, quite safe to say, I believe that the Czech Republic has really become sort of distinct in how far it actually went in sort of downplaying its own very strategic existence and, and sort of national <coughs> preferences, and uh, and focusing really on the uh, on the international, on uh, on the uh, on the contribution to the sort of international effort. Uh, this has sort of a long history. I mean, if you look at the existence of Czechoslovakia since uh, its inception in 1918, that has always been the case. I mean, the, the, the primary focus of the Czechoslovak diplomacy between World War I and World War II was actually to, to secure the country's position by aligning itself to many different actors regionally, with Romania, Yugoslavia then, uh, with countries in Western Europe, uh, particularly France, of course, and then later in 1930s, uh, even with with the uh, with the Soviet Union. What's interesting, and uh, and quite ironic, of course, is that uh, these efforts at uh, let's say a very strong international embedding of of, uh, the, of the defense policy of the country. Uh, have failed miserably twice throughout the century. First, of course, in 1938 with the Munich Agreement, and then in 1968 with the invasion of, uh, of the Warsaw Pact, uh, with the Warsaw Pact uh, forces uh, uh, into, into Czechoslovakia to suppress, let's say, the liberalization of the, of the communist regime. Uh, the interesting thing is that this, has, this does not seem to have cured the Czech political representation actually out of this preference, because if you look at uh, at uh, the strategic preferences after 1989 or 1993, when uh, independent Czech, uh, Czech Republic was established, uh, 
It's basically once again the same uh, sort of type of, uh, of, pr of preferences, only of course in reverse when it comes to the or foreign policy orientation, so from the east to the, to the west. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, a very, very similar mindset in the sense that it really is very strongly prefers or, and builds on the idea that we really need uh, to be a part of a, of a, of a broader, international, uh, broader international system and that we essentially only make sense when it comes to defense policy as a part of that, uh, of that, uh, of that system. Uh, which is linked to the second point here, and that's uh, when you look at the, at the specific strategies which were being adopted uh, since uh, the independent statehood in 1993, uh, you really see uh, a key role of what we might term the download of strategic priorities. So basically, uh, if you read uh, the NATO and EU documents and, and then you look at the, at the Czech documents from that side, you, you can see the similarity. Sometimes basically it's just downright to copy-paste strategy. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean that the Czech Republic uh, wouldn't have its own priorities, but that those priorities were basically defined in the sense that we need to be part of the international and because of that we are actually accepting the preferences that are being sort of imposed to us or offered to us uh, to put it in a more positive spin by the by the outside uh, the most clear example would uh, once again be the reorientation of the Czech defense policy after 2001 when we sort of jumped on the train of, uh, of, uh, of anti-terrorist campaign uh, sending the soldiers uh, to, to, to Afghanistan uh, and elsewhere in, in in order to basically be a part once again of the international of the international effort, <coughs> uh, there is. Uh a perceptible downside uh, to this, uh, or has been a perceptible downside to this preference, and that was uh, a sort of a negligence of uh, in maintaining the means of autonomous defense. Somehow, sort of also translated to the fact uh, that uh, the defense spending of the country has actually been going uh, down and down. So, so from the uh, slightly above two percent around 2001, 2002, it really dropped uh, to almost one percent. It has only slightly been going up in the recent years, so this year I believe it, uh, it should be 1.3% uh, and uh, five years ago the government actually promised to, to move up to 1.4% in 2020, which uh, will likely happen, but we still uh, stay more than a half percentage point below the recommended level of 2%. Uh, of GDP spent on uh, on defense. So uh, the internationalization strategy, to put it this way, uh, has also been connected uh, in a sort of a flip side of the coin arrangement uh, with uh, with uh, a clear uh, uh, with, with a uh, with a clear uh, not a strategy but but practice of uh, basically free riding so so relying on the others to to actually be uh, uh, bear uh, the more uh, the more important part of the of the defense spending once again that's not uniquely Czech of course I mean, can always say that uh, it's Europe as such who has been using uh, that strategy for the past 60 years one might one might say to, to a lesser or or a greater degree indeed. <coughs> the perceived problem that, uh, that we are facing uh, nowadays uh, is actually the, uh, the, the question whether the Czech, Rab Czech Republic is sort of drifting away uh, from, uh, from the commitment to transatlantic security or Euro and European uh, security, security structures. Uh, first of all, you don't see that in the strategy document, uh, which basically maintained the, the, the pretty much the same transatlantic uh, European uh, or Europeanist uh, outlook, the, the recent security strategy of the Czech Republic from 2015, the defense strategy, the, uh, the, 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 military, uh, the, the military policy, white books, so on and so forth, have basically been uh, following up in the same direction. Uh, the Czech Republic also uh, has uh, maintained its participation in international uh, in international operations. There are still Czech soldiers uh, in Afghanistan at the at the, uh, at the at the moment and elsewhere. So even in this regard, uh, you actually can't see uh, you can't see uh, any sort of a perceptible uh, perceptible problem. Uh, the um, problems uh, which uh, sort of underline the, the, the current discussion are more uh, related to what I would uh, say are the sort of real external threats rather than the declared ones. I mean, uh, if you read the security strategy of the Czech Republic from 2015, it lists uh, not less than 11 sort of main threats, which 
sort of offers a sort of an insight because there is a clear lack of hierarchization. I mean, if you have 11 main threads, it means that you can't particularly decide of, of what the main thread actually is at the moment, which, uh, which actually ignores the fact that there seem to be threads or challenges that are more intense and uh, more sort of demanding to be, to be dealt with than, uh, than others. Uh, the top three, if you read it in the order of appearance, uh, actually are uh, the weakening of international collective security commitments, uh, instability and armed conflicts in the neighborhood and terrorism. Uh, the first two actually are quite close to what the, what the sort of real problem I believe uh, could be and that's uh, the, the fear of the loosening of collective defense commitments, which uh, is a nice way of saying that the Czech Republic uh, foreign security defense policy establishment has been really scared uh, by the, especially the, the early declarations on the part of President Trump. I mean, the, the, the idea that the United States might not just be sort of uh, shifting its attention from Europe to the, to the Western Pacific, but that it might actually be considering not, uh, uh, not uh, committing itself to the defense of, uh, of, European, uh, of European allies, that really reverberated very, uh, very, uh, very strongly. Uh, the second external threats, uh, threat uh, is uh, the, Russian, the, the, the Russian revisionist, uh, revisionist policy. Unlike for Poland, definitely unlike uh, the, the Baltic states, the Czech Republic uh, is actually not uh, dealing or does not have to deal with uh, the territorial aspects of, the, uh, of, of Russian revisionism. The, the, there is uh, not a serious discussion about, uh, about uh, the possibility of, uh, of, a, of a Russian armed attack against the Czech Republic, unlike in the Baltic states, uh, where I believe uh, this, has been, uh, this has been discussed rather, uh, rather seriously, if still, uh, hopefully, hypothetically. But for the Czech Republic, uh, the issue has uh, had a sort of specific meaning in the form of, uh, of Russian disinformation campaign, the spread of fake, uh, the spread of fake news, uh, what was termed uh, information or hybrid warfare. So, so we have now established uh, a center for tackling the hybrid threats uh, uh, at the Ministry of uh, at the Ministry of the Interior, with a very specific and sort of clear focus on on the Russian sources of disinformation and uh, and uh, so-called uh, so-called fake news. So uh, so this threat was perceived uh, and has been actually handled. As very as very uh, very real. The problem being that the uh, that uh, the scope of the problem has been downplayed by uh, by some, once again top level, uh, top level politicians, which of course uh, makes the commitment of the people who are actually dealing with the threats uh, much more uh, much more difficult. Then there is an, uh, the the third point, which is uh, sort of more imagined than than real, but has had very real implications for the, uh, for the Czech policy and politics, and that's uh, the perceived identitarian threat uh, emanating from immigration. I, said it's, uh, I say it's imagined, because when you look at the numbers, there is actually uh, no immigration to the Czech Republic uh, in, uh, in any meaningful way. If uh, we think away uh, the substantial presence of Ukrainian workforce, which is not what, of course, the fear of immigration is, uh, is about. But despite the fact, uh, there has really been a very strong securitization of, uh, of the immigration issue up to a point that it actually got at least one party, new party, to, uh, to the parliament in the elections of 2017 by actually raising the issue of typically Islamic uh, immigration, which is non-existent, but nevertheless it provoked a sort of, uh, it managed to provoke such a, such a fear among part of the electorate that, uh, that it got substantial support. And uh, it also had an effect of actually sort of spreading across the political spectrum up to a point where the Czech Republic's uh, sort of mainstream political representation, for example, refused the European Union quota for the distribution of the, of, of the migrants, basically playing on this sort of almost nativist fear of letting in people who are different uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the Czechs. Uh, incidentally, uh, today uh, there was a comment in one of the major major uh, web uh, information service uh, uh, in, in Czech by the, by the Minister of, uh, of the Interior that he won't allow uh, the, the, uh, the application of the European quota. So it's an issue which is still pretty much alive despite the fact that of course uh, the, uh, uh, the perceived wave of immigration has really abated and it is uh, now a big issue def 
for some countries like Italy, for example, definitely not uh, for the Czech Republic in, uh, in practical terms. But it has really contributed to the sort of, a, uh, let's say, reorientation of, of the mindset of the Czech political, uh, political elite, which gets me to the sort of internal challenges. Until 2013, the Czech Republic has featured uh, one of uh, the most stable party system in systems in Central and Eastern Europe. Compared to Poland, uh, with a sort of constant reinvention of, of, of the parties and the makeup of the, of, of the, uh, of the party system, uh, the parties which were established uh, sort of early on after the elections of 1992 were the ones uh, which actually sort of alternated. So basically on the right it was uh, the the Civic Democratic Party, basically, uh, who call themselves in the European sense liberal conservative, which we basically can read as uh, libertarian, closest possible, uh, closest possible label to that. And on the left side, uh, the Czech Social Democratic Party, sort of standard socialist uh, grouping, uh, pretty much like, like it's, uh, for example, uh, German uh, or French uh, counterparts when it, uh, when it comes to that. So these two major parties, the, the, the poles of uh, the multi-party system have been alternating since 1992 uh, with uh, sort of short intermezzos of, uh, of uh, bureaucratic governments at a moment when a government fell because of sort of unexpected reasons. So in 1998, uh, the government of, uh, of the right-wing uh, coalition collapsed uh, after allegations of some dirty funding of, uh, of the major party. And there were sort of uh, several similar, uh, similar moments. Uh, by 2013, uh, there, uh, has, there was a rise of, uh, let's say, public concern with the level of what started to be perceived as systemic corruption how much systemic it really was, to what was the extent, uh, that's uh, of course still sort of a matter of, matter of contention, but nevertheless, uh, uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2013, uh, the governing coalition collapsed uh, and was then after the, after the elections basically replaced by the new makeup of the, of the system. Uh, the actual end of the of the coalition was uh, actually not uh, not uh, due to corruption or specific uh, specifically targeted corruption charges. It was a rare occasion when uh, when sort of sexual politics entered the the, the Czech uh, the Czech public life. When it turned out that uh, the prime minister's uh, head of office was also his uh, secret and actually not so secret lover, and uh, that uh, she apparently was. Uh, was uh, basically a mover and shaker of uh, many of the government policies. She, uh, from her position, she was actually able to, even to, to give orders to members of military intelligence to spy on the prime minister's wife. It's, it's sort of uh, an event of some operatic qualities which are really unusual in Czech politics. I mean, sex and politics doesn't, doesn't usually combine uh, so nicely, to put it this way, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, they, they did. But even that moment, which was sort of very personal, uh, was really put into the broader context of, uh, of uh, sort of perceiving the public, uh, public elites or political elites as, as corrupt. And uh, the major uh, right-wing party, the Civic Democrats, uh, really uh, suffered heavy, heavy losses in the 2013 elections, going from close to 30% to uh, less than 8%, which was a formidable uh, downfall. And uh, pretty much the same actually happened uh, in 2011 with the, with the Social Democrats who formed the government after 2013 with one of the newly, uh, newly rising parties. What happened then was that actually under the cloak of the fight against corruption, a new host of political parties were formed and actually successfully entered the parliament. Uh, basically following sort of populist, uh, populist policies uh, and uh, sometimes with sort of uh, open disregard with the, to the continuity of, uh, of even sort of uh, strong focus on European and transatlantic security and, and defense uh, and defense cooperation. The other event which, uh, which sort of shake, uh, shook uh, the, the Czech political scene was the introduction of the direct election of the of the president uh, until uh, until 2012 uh, the president uh, was actually elected by the parliament uh, but uh, the elections uh, in 2003 and 2008 actually were so complicated and were actually regarded as being sort of corrupted in the political sense that uh, there was a very strong public pressure to do something about that. So that something turned out to be a, ch a shift uh, to, direct, uh, to direct election. 
which uh, might not have been a problem, but uh, it was introduced without basically any regard to the sort of broader constitutional makeup. So we just switched to direct election, left everything else in place, which meant that uh, some, of, uh, the, uh, some of the powers of the president, which were uh, actually executed by him previously, uh, more or less symbolically, and definitely in consultation with typically the governing coalition, or more broadly the parties and the parliament have now been sort of assumed to be a sort of uh, exclusive right uh, to be performed solely by the president. So Miloš Zeman, the former head of the Social Democratic Party, uh, who became the president in 2013 in the first direct election, basically almost immediately tried to sort of uh, assume more powers than were exercised by his predecessors. He named actually a government uh, which uh, uh, totally disrespected uh, the um, balance of forces in the in the parliament that power, uh, that government uh, didn't get a parliamentary approval through which actually the parliament sort of uh, refused uh, the president's ambition to sort of transform the uh, the system into a clear semi presidential one but nevertheless since 2013 the president has been sort of trying to push uh, the agenda ever further trying to impose more of his ideas his will his policy preferences on the on the government uh, than uh, than was the the case before before the direct election was uh, was uh, was introduced among other things uh, the new president uh, one of the long-serving politicians uh, who actually came to prominence already in, uh, in uh, before mid-1990s uh, gradually sort of shifted away from the, let's say, Atlanticist and Europeanist consensus by focusing on the development of relations with, uh, with other countries, uh, obviously favoring uh, developing relations with some of the unsavory ones, uh, such as Putin's Russia or Xi Jinping's uh, China. I mean, uh, Miloš Zeman has become single-handedly the most uh, uh, the most committed promoter of uh, forging what he called the strategic partnership between the Czech Republic and uh, and China, which is actually not materialized on basically at any uh, any level, but uh, did sort of manage to damage the image of the Czech Republic among uh, among its uh, its Western European uh, European uh, European allies. Among other things, uh, the rise of uh, these new parties, new politicians, has uh, actually contributed. Uh, to sort of a dismay as to what the strategic preferences of the Czech Republic should be. So we do have the formal declaration, we, we still have the documents, but uh, it is very hard to actually identify what the Czech Republic's representation actually tries to achieve. Well, what is it that we want to be pursuing within the European Union, within, uh, within NATO? Uh, apart from uh, being sort of trying to be sort of skeptical of any uh, initiative which, uh, which tries to sort of push the typically European integration any, any further, be it uh, the quotas on the on the division of the of the of the immigrants, or be it closer monetary or fiscal policies, the Czech representation has actually uh, been sort of in a uh, adopted a mode of trying to veto what we don't like. The problem being that we don't actually send the signals as, as to what we actually do like and, and what we want to what we want to achieve. When sort of assessing the scope of the problem, uh, I would argue that uh, the level of, int of external threats uh, to Czech security is still relatively marginal. I mean, uh, there is apparently uh, a disinformation campaign, I really loathe to the term hybrid war because I, I think it implies more than it's actually happening, but there's apparently uh, a campaign uh, of disinformation and spreading of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of fake news, basically sort of trying to sow distrust typically in the, uh, in the, uh, in the political establishment. Uh, but uh, the main problem of that is not necessary that it is, it is, it is happening, it is that it actually uh, it arrives at a population which seems to be sort of confused in itself. So, so the problem is not necessarily that, that Russia, or China for that matter, is trying to do something. It's uh, that uh, the society and the political elite, which should sort of notionally lead it and, and, and give it some sense of orientation, actually don't, uh, don't seem to be able to, to find that proper direction and to communicate, uh, and to communicate that. <coughs> Uh, at the formal level and in practical policies when we talk about defense and security, nothing has actually changed uh, in Czech Republic's commitment to NATO uh, 
and the European Union in broad terms. I mean, the European Union case is, uh, is sort of more problematic than NATO. Uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of sort of Eurosceptic positioning in the uh, in the Czech in, in Czech politics. Not so much anti-American positioning actually. So, so the transatlantic uh, consensus, at least in practical terms, seems to be relatively uh, seems to be relatively strong. But once again, I mean, if you asked. Uh, the Czech, uh, the top Czech politicians, but also I'm, I'm afraid the opposition of what the Czech Republic is actually trying to achieve through NATO or within NATO, uh, they would be sort of hard pressed to, to sort of search for, for, meaningful, for meaningful answers. <coughs> So uh, I believe that the biggest problem is that uh, the internal political consensus on strategic uh, priorities has been badly damaged. It's been damaged by the new parties which actually have uh, either failed to formulate their strategic priorities. I mean, you look at uh, the, the major governing party of, uh, of Prime Minister, uh, Minister Babish and uh, you search for sort of set of clear foreign policy priorities and you can't find them because they are just, just not, uh, not, uh, not there. Uh, apart from uh, very often exhibited signs of sort of latent uh, anti-EU uh, anti positions. So, so, so there's been, that's uh, been developed as sort of a meme in, in Czech politics, but apart from that, uh, it's, it's hard to find a program. What you can find, uh, unfortunately, is politicians uh, with apparently anti-European, anti-Western programs. From the president who tried to forge the strategic partnership with, uh, with China to some of the parties which clearly try to sort of distance the Czech Republic from its, uh, from its EU and, and, NATO, and NATO membership which are, who are still in opposition but, but nevertheless. Ideas that uh, were only floated uh, on the very margins of the political spectrum uh, in let's say 1990s or 2000s there always, of course, were parties critical of, uh, of the established order, be it the communists on the left or the so-called republicans on the, on the very, uh, very right. Uh, but that was limited to, let's say, 15% of the vote. And now you can see sort of uh, even parties who are closer to what is now perceived as, as the political mainstream floating ideas uh, that uh, would be sort of uh, unacceptable just a uh, just couple, uh, couple of years back. <coughs> so... Uh, I promised a sort of a prognosis. I, I don't actually want to do that, but uh, it's not so difficult at the moment, I'm afraid, to imagine a situation where the combination of external pressures, so, so something goes over the top in US policies, for example, or the post-Brexit developments uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the European Union, there might be sort of a uh, overreaction on the French German part trying to push uh, the sort of uh, pu push uh, the, the integration process further to a degree that would be really hardly acceptable for the for the Czech political elites uh, when the sort of uh, still continuing uh, fragile consensus on the Czech Republic's belonging to the West might actually uh, might actually be not just damaged uh, but uh, but potentially uh, potentially broken. I mean, it's uh, it's not so difficult to imagine a sort of a perfect storm of uh, Donald Trump's strategic miscalculation combined uh, with economic recession in, in in Europe and the ensuing rise of the more sort of populist uh, parties in the. In, uh, in the Czech parliament and you might actually get a governing coalition which will, for example, uh, uh, declare a referendum on, on the Czech Republic uh, staying in the European Union, which has been an idea floated already. Uh, already after the last elections actually, uh, the, the current prime minister actually did have a practical choice of, of governing with, the, let's say, the more extreme parts of the political spectrum. So, so one, with one of the anti-immigration parties and the communists, he would have made up a majority in the, in the parliament. Uh, he refused to do that, so he aligned with the Social Democrats and uh, the, the, the minority, uh, minority coalition actually enjoys tacit supports by the communists in the parliament. Uh, but uh, if, uh, the, if the elections go badly, for let's say the liberal democratic uh, uh, camp, it's not so hard to imagine that uh, that next time, so after the ten, uh, 2021 elections, uh, the situation might uh, might turn uh, turn uh, for the worse. 
or not perhaps i mean that's uh, that's really hard to uh, that's really hard to predict there of course and that's important to mention uh, before i before i finish uh, there has of course been an opposition a very lively opposition to to this sort of populist uh, illiberal streak in czech uh, in czech politics uh, there are still sort of uh, lively and kicking opposition parties there is public opposition there is uh, civil society concern with the policies of the uh, of the president and the prime and the prime minister so and uh, the makeup of uh, of uh, the of, of the societal media uh, system has not uh, has not been changed uh, as it has in Hungary for example there were not even sort of changes uh, like the ones in Poland where the government essentially nationalized uh, the, uh, the the public tv and uh, and radio stations. So, so uh, there are still sort of uh, very important pillars of uh, the functioning of the liberal democratic system, including, of course, uh, the, the constitutional courts and others. Uh, so, formally speaking, everything is working along the same lines as it has since 1993. The, the danger being that if there is a continuation of, uh, of, of, of a government uh, or if there is a sort of a more extreme version of a, of a populist, uh, populist government in the future, there might be an attempt to, to, actually changing, uh, to actually changing that. So far that has not happened. So far uh, the, uh, we don't have to return to Europe because we are still in there. Uh, uh, one can hope that it will it will it will remain so for the foreseeable future. But but as I said, there are certain sort of risks and uh, and, and, and problems which uh, which point to the possibility of uh, of another direction. So I will stop here, and of course I will gladly answer your questions or tackle your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomat. Um, uh, I'll just Let's throw it over. Please. Uh -huh. um, what is the, the feared expectation of what would happen if the US disengaged? That's an excellent question. Uh, it's actually, and that's something I, I forgot to mention. Uh, it really, uh, it really lines uh, to uh, to the internationalist outlook. What uh, what I uh, of what uh, what I would call this Czech strategic culture, because for the Czech Republic, it's sort of hardly imaginable to, to sort of function without that uh, internationalist uh, framework. So one can imagine that if uh, if uh, things go south in transatlantic relations, Poland will sort of revert to the mode of actually relying more on their uh, or on their own means. So so strengthening their armed forces, strengthening the, the mechanisms of territorial defense, possibly cooperating more closely with the Baltic countries, something like that. Maybe engaging uh, in, in in Ukraine. Who knows? For the Czech Republic, it's really hard to imagine this because the country has sort of betted so strongly on uh, on NATO and the European structures to actually to actually be there. Of course, one of the one of uh, the paradoxical components of the current developments is that uh, the very politicians who are actually afraid of what it might mean for the Czech Republic to sort of stand alone, having to stand alone. Uh, and whether it would really mean standing alone or just standing together with the other Europeans, that's a, that's a good question. But uh, the very politicians who are, uh, who are afraid of this are the ones who actually sort of undermine some of the mechanisms of, let's say, collective consultation and, and uh, sort of creation of a, of a consensus, typically at the European Union, uh, European Union level. Uh, so the fear, I think that the fear is not... Not that, not one of sort of immediacy. So I mean, if uh, if if Donald Trump just says, okay, we won't uh, we won't honor our commitments uh, for the Baltic countries, uh, the feeling would be of immediate threat uh, because uh, because they sort of knew that if Russia really did attack, whether it would or not, another big good question. But uh, for them, it is uh, it is a matter of uh, of, of sort of uh, life emergency, right, or very existence of the sin. That's not the same for for the for the Czech Republic, but it would mean that uh, the Czech political elite would really be deprived of this important anchoring. And the problem is that uh, when I point to the, to the past experiences of 1968-1938, the situation of uh, sort of uh, being betrayed by the sort of external guarantors of, uh, of our security has always resulted in the rise of the more nasty elements uh, in, in the Czech political scene. So in 1938, 
the so-called Second Republic was created, uh, created which uh, could be likened to, I don't know, the Vichy regime uh, as, a, as a possible, possible comparison. So, so, so in, in fact, a very nasty proto-authoritarian regime of, uh, of our very own making. After 1968, uh, there were the big purges of the more liberal members of the communist of the communist party and uh, and uh, the, the 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 ones who were the the uh, the less successful uh, the more devoted to the soviet union very often the more stupid the less intelligent the the, the less sort of experience sort of got got to uh, to the positions of power so the, my fear is that if there re really is another situation uh, where uh, the sort of international uh, guarantees for Czech security sort of breakdown. Uh, it would lead, uh, it would really play into the hands or into the more populist uh, and illiberal elements of the of the Czech politics. So there would, I don't think there would be an immediate sort of external threat, but there would be an immediate internal threat because uh, these people would then say, look, everything that you committed yourself to actually uh, was proven not to be working. So we offer you a solution typically aligning it, uh, themselves to someone else and to, uh, we of course know what the options uh, what the options might be if that covers the the question <laughs> Uh, so I start from the top. The Czech president apparently loves Vladimir Putin. He's uh, the only one who actually talks to the Czech president or li likes to talk, he, who, who likes to actually honor him. And uh, Miloš Zeman knows uh, very well that he actually is not very much honored to the West, so he looks to the East. And of course, the Russian president and the Chinese president have been uh, have been clever enough to actually play into uh, I into that. So, so pointing out how important blah 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 that the Czech president is to uh, is, is to them. Uh, the Czech relations to Russia are sort of uh, more complex uh, and sort of. Uh, how to put it, modulated than the ones, for example, in, in Poland. I mean, in Poland, if you look wherever you stand on the liberal uh, or the conservative nationalist side, typically tend to not to like uh, Russia very much, to put it to put it mildly, and it's just about the sort of shade of, of the dislike. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, there has, uh, Russia has really been more associated uh, with uh, with the with our own past so, so as the guarantor of the Czechoslovak uh, of the Czechoslovak regime pre 1989 so i don't think there is actually a very large group of people who would uh, have very positive feelings about the russian regime it's but there is a sort of disgruntled part of the electorate uh, who feel uh, they have been sort of locked out of the economic and social success uh, which was, uh, of course, uh, uh, reality for, uh, for, for, for a large part of the, of, of the society after 1918, but, but not the total sum of, uh, sum of people. So for these people, Russia is uh, sort of, it's not that Russia is attractive, it's, it's, it's rather that Russia is seen as an opposition to what is regarded uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of criticized as, as the Western liberal establishment. And the liberal components might mean anything from uh, stronger pro-environmental protection policies to the empowerment of, of sexual minorities. Uh, it, it really, it's anything that sort of smells of progressivism, to, to, put, it, uh, to put it this way. So Russia uh, has been sort of, and of course Russia has been playing in, in, into that by, by criticizing the Western liberalism and sort of aligning it with, the, uh, with, with what is typically portrayed as the decadent policies that, uh, in, in the vein that I've uh, that I've mentioned. So uh, it's not about, uh, it's, I, I would argue that it's not about liking Russia, but there is a substantial part of, uh, of a population uh, that's simply not very much content, uh, at least uh, outwardly, uh, with the sort of uh, pro-Western sort of liberal, uh, liberal tendencies. Uh, to, measure, uh, to, to, to measure that part of the population it's sort of uh, sort of difficult. I mean, uh, in the the last presidential vote uh, was 51% uh, for the current uh, president, who might be seen as a sort of a representative of these sort of illiberal, anti-liberal tendencies, and 49% for his opponent, who basically positioned himself as as the direct opposite. So, so trying to preserve that 
sort of uh, liberal democratic uh, liberal democratic outlook. Uh, that would be the maximum, so a half of the population. In reality, it's, it's uh, definitely much less. So, so the support for the uh, for these sort of extreme parties who are now in the parliament, the anti-immigration uh, party got uh, what eight percent in the uh, in the vote. Uh, the prime minister's sort of populist uh, political movement uh, got twenty eight percent. So I believe that somewhere between one fourth and one third, perhaps, of the population is the one which is really not uh, very satisfied. On the other hand, the criticism of the pre-2013 political system does not necessarily mean that the people who uh, were dissatisfied were against liberal democracy. I mean, the push for anti-corruption uh, policies uh, could also be interpreted as slightly sort of liberal in the sense they, that the people wanted to repair the democracy rather than sort of replace it with something something else. And that, of course, is the true for many of the supporters of the, of the current prime minister and possibly the president. So. Uh, uh, to get back to the to get back to the question, Russia uh, is not part of the discussion as uh, as a sort of a potential other pole to which to align, unless of course you listen to the president who has really been sort of uh, very different from the rest of the political spectrum, one might say. Uh, but it is uh, it serves as a as a sort of a sort of tacit source. Of, uh, of the support for those uh, who, who actually oppose the sort of more liberal tendencies of the, in, the, uh, in the system. Thank you. Unfortunately, um, uh, Tomasz has to, uh, to go to David Hagelin's right. uh, class, and so I'm going to have to call it right here. Um, but I did want to, on behalf of the Center, um, to thank Tomasz very much for the presentation. Thank and you for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. This is uh, oh, a little thank you. token thank you. of our. That's very our kind. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.